Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Martin Rees, the president of the Royal Society, and it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone here for what's one of our uh, most uh, uh, enjoyable annual events, the presentation of the Royal Society Book Prize. It's important to the Royal Society because communication of science is so important. And communication of science is also very hard. And I have to say that uh, articles and broadcasts about science always deepen my respect for journalists who prepare them. Because I find it very hard to explain in clear language even something in my own field that I think I understand. And these uh, journalists have to cover something quite unfamiliar to them, working to a tight deadline. And they have to go on in front of a camera and speak without hesitation, deviation or repetition about something they learnt about half an hour ago. And I think that's a real challenge. And we should admire the professionals. And, of course, the scientists aren't always very helpful. Uh, some are uncommunicative. Some sometimes hype up their own contributions. But I think we therefore do have to admire the uh, scientists who try and become amateur communicators because they have to realise how hard it is. But many of us try to do this part-time. And I personally derive much less satisfaction from my work if it only interested a few other specialists. It's a challenge to get through to a wide audience, um, but uh, uh, it's important to do it. It's a challenge just as teaching at an elementary level is harder than teaching advanced pupils. In the past, science didn't really need these interpreters. Darwin, for instance, didn't have to be popularised because his own Origin of Species was a bestseller, readily accessible, even fine literature, as well as an epochal contribution to science. And its impact on general culture resonates even to today. But that was an exception. Einstein's ideas have penetrated our culture, but very few read his original works. And the barrier is always high when the ideas can be fully expressed only in maths. Indeed, that barrier existed right back in Newton's time. His great work, The Principia, was heavy going even for his distinguished contemporaries like Halley and Hooke. But within a few decades, other authors had distilled his ideas into accessible form. And in fact, in the 1730s, there was a book that was published entitled Newtonianism for Ladies. <laughs> well, there's now a new barrier to scientific understanding, and that is that the expansion of science has led to a real information overload, which neither Darwin nor Newton confronted. Literally millions of scientific papers are published every year. They're what scientists call the literature. But this immense wordage bears the same relation to real literature that military music does to real music. <laughs> the papers are addressed to fellow specialists. They have very few readers. And this literature does need to be sifted and synthesised. And the gulf between what's written for specialists and what's accessible to the average reader is widening. And science is now covered, of course, in broadcasts, newspaper reports, and the blogosphere, and all these media are trying to uh, present science in a more accessible way. But the surest way to ensure that the ideas get through undistorted is via the written world, in articles and books. Most scientists dislike writing. It's a chore rather than a pleasure. I never wrote a sentence between the age of 16 and 21, having had a rather narrow scientific and mathematical education. <coughs> Present-day students are far more fluent in writing than my own pre-email, pre-blog generation were. They're fluent, but not always very literate. <laughs> and I have, in later years, written some books myself, but these have grown from articles, notes for talks, and so forth, which I've then tried to mesh together. And I envy fluent writers like my colleague John Barrow, for instance, who can conceive a book and then write fluently, starting at the beginning and finishing at the end. 
Quite a few distinguished scientists have been successful authors. Indeed, it's a UK tradition. Hoyle and Medawa come to mind, and among the living, Dawkins, Barrow, and Stewart. And I think if one looks at the books that are successful, then there are some tricks. It helps to avoid jargon and equations. Uh, it helps to mention sex. It helps even more to mention God, it seems. <laughs> but some books do achieve success against the odds. I don't know if you saw Roger Penrose's book, The Road to Reality, which had thousands of equations. It would challenge even a PhD, but it made the uh, New York Times bestseller list. And his new book, just out, is almost as opaque as that one. <laughs> so there are eminent scientists who write successful books. But many of the most successful science authors are interpreters and synthesizers and not active researchers. Some focus on particular areas of science. One thinks, for instance, of uh, Matt Ridley, Simon Singh, and Colin Tudge. Some are cultural historians, like Richard Holmes, a recent winner of this prize. And others, like Nigel Calder and John Gribbin, extend their skills over the whole of science. And Bill Bryson has marvellously conveyed his zest and enthusiasm for almost everything to millions. And having mentioned Bill Bryson, let me make a plug. Uh, Bill Bryson edited for the Royal Society's 350th anniversary uh, a book called Seeing Further, which was published earlier this year. It contains 20 chapters by a range of authors, um, novelists, historians, and scientists. And uh, I highly recommend this as a Christmas present uh, for all your friends. And this exemplifies that science books are important. It's important to present science as part of our culture. Indeed, science is the only truly global culture. Protons and proteins are the same everywhere. And everyone needs to understand science, not just because it's a deprivation not to understand the marvellous story that modern science presents, but because we all need a feel for the science that pervades our lives, and we'll do so even more in future, to be able to participate in debates on the environmental and ethical challenges it poses. We should all care about our planet and its fate, and books are the best way in which non-specialists can get a feel for this. And that's why it is so good that the Royal Society has run this book prize since 1988. And I'd like to thank Adrian Beecroft for being the sponsor this year, as he was last. And I'd like, uh, at this stage, in case I forget later, to thank the Royal Society staff involved in doing the work behind this prize, and to thank uh, the judges. And I now uh, am going to hand over to the chair of the judges, uh, Maggie Philbin. She's worked in radio and TV for over 30 years on science, medical and technology programmes, she did the BBC One's Inside Out programme, Swap Swap at Tomorrow's World. And more recently, she created Teen Tech, which brought young teenagers, scientists and technology companies together, and which won the Best Engineering Event Prize in Science Week this year. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Maggie as the Chair of the Judges and to hand over the proceedings to her. She will chair the rest of this evening's events. So, thank you, Maggie. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, and, and good evening. It's, it's a real pleasure to see so many of you here tonight. Um, uh, it is quite terrifying to think how long it is. I, I'm, I'm beginning to... Um, feel sort of late, sometimes slightly fraudulent. I mean, I, I did Tomorrow's World for 10 years from 1982, and I'm, I'm betting that that's where most of you know me from. Um, already, uh, one of our shortlisted authors has claimed that he used to watch me when he was seven, and we'll just see, <laughs> we'll just see how far that gets him. <laughs> um, I'd also like to say how refreshing it is to be standing in front of an audience of geeks without having some unreliable prototype in my hands ready to show me up at any moment. Um, uh, seriously, though, I, I was deeply honoured to be asked to help judge um, this prize. Um, deeply honoured and a little daunted when all of those boxes of books arrived on my doorstep. Um, 
But since then, those books have been enjoyed not only by myself, but by my 22-year-old daughter, all of her friends, all of our street. Um, I've become a bit of an unofficial lending library, and as Rose said, um, we've got a better science section than Waterstones. Um, I'd also like to thank the authors who are present today and the uh, sort of hundred-odd whose books we have read over the past six months, because Rose attributes her first that she collected from Manchester University to the fact that her reading was so broad and that she managed to have so many 2009 and 2010 references. Um, of course, it's always a real joy to read a good book. Um, and, and a good book is one that you cannot bear to put down. Um, it, it takes you on a journey. It has fabulous characters. It makes you um, aware of things that you were never aware of before. It moves you. Um, and and you, you emerge from the experience feeling that you have to tell other people about it. And science books do all of that, except that, of course, the world and the, the characters they describe are real ones. And by reading really good science books, we learn more about ourselves, more about our world, and more about our universe. And this prize is really important because it does an excellent job of flagging up the books which have the kind of writing which will fill that massive information gap that Lord Rees has just intimated, which exists between the kind of work that scientists are doing, that the kind of knowledge that scientists have, the knowledge that scientists want to have, and the general perception that many of us have about what science is all about. Um, because it's only when you do have enough knowledge, that you can make informed decisions, that you can decide it is worth spending £500 on this pot of face cream um, or £4.6 on science research. And it's only when you have that kind of knowledge that you can make the right kind of decisions. Um, so as you're gathering, um, judging this prize really has been a huge responsibility. But thankfully, it's one that I've been able to share with a team of, number one, really lovely, number two, really talented, number three, very knowledgeable judges. And uh, I'd like to introduce them to you now. Um, later on, we'll be meeting the authors. They will be reading from their books. And we'll also um, throw uh, sort of questions open to the floor so that you can find out if you've read the books, you know, why the authors wrote them. Um, but, but first of all, I'd like you to welcome our judges, and they are um, Dr. Janet Anders, who's a Royal Society Dorothy, Dorothy Hodgkin Fellow in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at University College London, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Tim, Tim Burkhead, who's Professor of Evolution and Behaviour at the University of Sheffield and also a Fellow of the Royal Society. And Tracy Chevalier, who, of course, is an award-winning novelist and has books including the, the Girl with a Pearl Earring and Remarkable Creatures. Robin Ince uh, was also a judge. It's a real shame he can't be with us tonight. Um, he, he was great company on the judging panel, but sadly he can't be with us. And, and you'll know him, of course, as a, a comedian, a writer, and uh, he's also got a, a fabulous film which is out at the moment. Um, and because it was such an egalitarian process, I'm, I'm going to ask Tracy just to talk us through the the judging process, because I'm sure some of you are quite intrigued as to how we made our decisions. Well, yes, you mentioned that the, it was very daunting receiving those huge boxes of books. And uh, I think for, for me in particular, I found it uh, hard because um, I'm a novelist, I'm not a scientist, but my last novel was about fossil hunter, and so I did read a lot of science uh, books before that. Uh, so I was familiar with reading them. I just wasn't familiar with going through 134 of them. So it was quite uh, daunting, but I realized after a while that a nonfiction popular science book is not necessarily so different from reading a novel. It's a, uh, it needs to tell a story, it needs to tell it well, it needs to be structured well. So there were things that I looked for in each of the books that I read um, that I applied uh, criteria that I would have anyway with, with novels. So in the end, I did settle into it, though I was very grateful to have scientists, of course, with me to say, no, actually, there's a better book about this subject um, than the one that you've read. So let's, uh, let's go on and look at a different one. But Janet, you come at it from an opposite of, to me. I was, uh, I'm a novelist, not a scientist. You're a scientist, not a novelist. What did you find the most... Um, 
interesting part of, of reading. Did you find reading your subject matter, your field, um, did you enjoy reading the books that were in your field, or did you prefer to read things that were completely different from what you knew about? Well, I prefer reading books that are outside my field because I read a lot of, of scientific papers in my field. So I, I prefer to read a popular book about, for instance, biology or history of science or things that I don't usually read. And what I like about it when I read a book is if, if it presents um, a story, but it shows you a way of, uh, it's like a detective story. You find out over time what the book is about, what science is about, and, and you have a sense of discovery. And this is what I was looking for. So it changes books. you a little bit. It or something changes in your me mind. a little bit. It, yeah. I, I have a, like an aha effect. Oh, wow. This is something that I have never realized before, and it's really interesting and may even change the way I see my daily life. Right. <laughs> Tim, you've written popular science books yourself. What makes a good popular science book, in your opinion? Uh, because I'm a, a researcher and a teacher, I'm, I read popular science books largely in the hope that I'm going to find better ways of educating young scientists and inspiring them. So I'm looking for books that are inspirational, exciting to read, and very accessible. I think that's incredibly important. I feel passionate about this, and I think that popular science writing is fantastic, and the, the range of books that we've looked at has been fantastic. And I, as a, I teach um, biology at the University of Sheffield, and I'm convinced we could teach a biology degree simply by using popular science books, by and large, uh, particularly at first year level and second year level, when you're trying to get students engaged and, and that aha factor, you know, and blown away by exciting ideas and good writing. And uh, I don't want to contradict Lord Rees, but he said that young scientists or uh, young undergraduates are good at writing. Most of them are awful at writing. So reading, <laughs> reading good, good writing is another way you can help to educate them. We did, uh, I admit, in our uh, judging, at times talk about the covers. Maggie, do you think you can judge a book by its cover? <laughs> I think it's probably just as well we didn't judge books by their covers. Um, and it's quite interesting, and maybe our, our authors will be able to um, talk a little bit about this later, but uh, sometimes I, I just couldn't believe some of the covers on the books. Um, and it seemed like about you know, five minutes had just been devoted to deciding what was, the cover was going to be. And it was a, you know, just a real shame. The books were really let down. They gave you no indication of what was inside. And people do choose books. You know, that's the thing that catches your eye in a bookshop. I think, though, it's more to do with science publishing, the way publishing looks at how science should be presented to the public mm. that, is, that is at issue here, rather than what the scientists themselves have written. It's, um, it's sometimes I think that publishers can't decide whether they want to just shove it out or they want to go overboard and try to pr convince readers that something is, is accessible. And it's, it's a fine line to, to uh, draw between those two, I think. And you know the other thing, because I might as well just make myself completely un unpopular with science publishers now, is the size of the print. And whether it's just because I'm getting, you know, a little bit ancient, but I find some of the books really difficult because <laughs> the print was so tiny and the fonts were so unfriendly. Um, so I'm just, just mentioning that now. So. I, don't think, oh no, I agree. I don't think publishers pay enough attention to the, to the overall feel of the book. You know, it's got to look inviting. Again, as an educator, undergraduates open a book and they go, oh, not, and they haven't read a word. And you can tell, you know, just the way a book's designed, the size of the font and so on, makes a huge difference to the accessibility. The book has got to draw you in and want to read it. That's the initial, that's the job of the publishers. But in the end... Six floated to the top. Were, were, it, were any of you surprised by, by the shortlist? Did anything surprise you about it? I know we all had, I do remember, we all had our books that we thought, oh, that didn't get on the shortlist. But I think that's true of any judging panel that you start through. And I found for myself that um, books change when you reread them, too. Because as a judge, you can't, I couldn't base my own opinion on one reading. I needed to make sure how I felt about something. Usually it didn't change too much, but sometimes I, it really deepens as you go through it again. Did you find that this, the, a similar situation? <clears throat> you definitely feel, <clears throat> 
feel differently about, about a book on a second reading. The hardest part of the whole judging process was the initial, um, you know, 130 books. Yeah, we need right. to have 12. And, and that was really difficult. And I think as, as, as a team, mm. that was the meeting that went on the longest and was, was really, really tough. Um, and particularly, actually, in, in a year where there were so many books about Darwin, I think that was something else, you know. Um, and, and it seems churlish to complain about so many books about Darwin, but there were. Um, and, you know, so, some hard decisions had to be made. Yes, and sometimes uh, I think we were talking earlier about comparing. How do you compare an apple and an orange? Mm -hmm. And it often felt like that, two books that are equally well-written, equally beautifully structured and tell a wonderful story, but you, uh, you uh, uh, want one over the other. Why is that? And it's a, it's a very difficult uh, decision to make, I think, in the end. Yeah, especially because of the very broad range of books that we had. I mean, we had not only biology books, physics books, and so on. We had history of science, um, educational books, encyclopedias, biographies. Um, it was a huge list of very different styles. I think one of the criteria that we all uh, used was that the book had to s tell a big story. It had to be a, a, an important message. You know, there were some fantastically written books that dealt with rather narrow topics that we felt couldn't really be shortlisted because the topic was so narrow. So I think the, the uh, list of books that we've got tonight all do something big and important. Mm. Very true. And uh, I, I think, I mean, it, it, it's very easy um, uh, sort of after the event to look back and think, actually, that book perhaps should have been on the long list. But we, we've sort of like talked as a panel, and though we all have books that we think, oh, that would have been really fabulous to have... Well, also just because obviously the, you know, the long list gets publicity and, and it means that perhaps more people will read it. But we couldn't... You know, we all had different favourite <laughs> books that we like for completely different reasons. And I think that you at times were marvellous in, um, because you had a couple of books which were, were quite tough, actually, from a mathematical point of view, <laughs> which the, the panel gamely had a real go at several times. And then we admitted complete and utter defeat and said, you know, we accept that it's a marvellous book, but we have tried three times now. We, you know, we can't crack it. So. But I was relieved that at the last, actually the last two meetings, the book that has won, um, we were unanimous about. And it was, it was becoming reasonably clear early on. And I think that that's a good sign, that what your gut feeling is at the start continues on through to the end. And um, later on, if you have any uh, questions for our uh, judges, you're very welcome to, um, you know, to ask them, put them. I've, I've got some questions here, and we'll be um, chatting about them later. But for the moment, can I hear it once again for our judging team? Thank you. <laughs> and... Um, because we thought it would be rather nice for you to have a taste of our shortlisted books, we've done something which I appreciate must be really difficult for all of our authors because we've asked them to give you a short reading. And that just gives you an idea, really, of, of, of the difficulty of choice that we had and, and how different all of these books are. So, um, first up... A World Without Ice. Um, now, this is Henry Pollock's book, and it explores the relationship between ice and people, the impact of ice on Earth, its climate, and its human residents, uh, as well as the impact that people are now having on ice and the climate. And the reason we chose this book was because we felt it was thoughtful, um, it was quite refreshing, it really did bring ice to life. Um, it was well-researched, and it certainly had a personal touch. Would you please welcome Henry Pollock. Thank you, Maggie, and the other judges of the panel. And thank you, Lord Rees. I'm honored to join this panel of distinguished authors and the esteemed fellows of the Royal Society as we gather to celebrate both the Society's 350th anniversary and the principles of scientific inquiry that the Society has so long championed. 
I think it's fair to say that there has never been an organization whose members have made a deeper impact over such an extended period on our understanding of the natural world. Today, in a world of unprecedented challenges, the pursuit of scientific knowledge has never been more important, and I am grateful to the Royal Society for all that it does to promote this endeavor, however controversial the scientific truth may ultimately be. As Maggie Philbin has said, my book, A World Without Ice, is a, a book about ice, climate, and people. The role ice has played in the development of Earth's landscape, its climate, and human civilization, and the reciprocal impact that people are now having on the planet's ice. The book looks at the relationship between ice and people over roughly 1,000 generations. It begins some 20,000 years ago at the peak of the last ice age, when there was lots of ice and very few people. It continues forward to today, early in the 21st century, when there's much less ice and nearly 7 billion people collectively having a profound impact on Earth's atmosphere, oceans, land, climate, and ice. The book then looks ahead to the possibility and consequences of a future world uh, without ice. Telling the story of Earth's changing climate through the prism of ice is especially revealing. In the wide array of nature's own thermometers, ice is particularly unequivocal. And in the context of the heated political environment that has fueled the climate change debate in recent years, ice is entirely neutral in its testimony. Let me read a brief passage from the book. Nature's best thermometer, perhaps its most sensitive and unambiguous indicator of climate change, is ice. Ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates. It is not burdened by ideology and carries no political baggage as it crosses the threshold from solid to liquid. It just melts. As scientists and as citizens, it is vitally important that we do not let the quiet voice of nature be overwhelmed by the shouting voices of uncivil and agenda-driven political discourse. The natural world talks to us every day, but many people either do not hear it or they refuse to listen. Many do not understand the language of nature nor recognize the urgency of its message. Within this century, we may see 100 million climate refugees from rising sea level, diminished agricultural and drinking water for a third of Earth's population, and an ice-free Arctic Ocean with attendant geopolitical tensions for the first time in human history. I hope that my book, A World Without Ice, will help refocus the public's attention on the serious and lasting changes uh, that are taking place in the natural world and on the looming consequences we are inflicting on ourselves and on our descendants and on the power we have as individuals, as citizens in our communities and as a society to change course while there is yet time. Again, I am deeply honored to join all of you here this evening. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Henry. Um, we move on now to everyday practice of science where intuition and passion meet objectivity and logic. Um, now, this is a book by Frederick Grinnell and is essentially a look behind the scenes, showing how scientists bring their own interests and passions to their work and looking at how they deal with issues of integrity, ethics and politics. 
And we chose this one because we felt it was a very revealing book about the nature of the scientific mind, what makes scientific minds tick. And we felt it was a very useful read for anyone with an interest in science, whether they were a pupil at school or a politician. So would you please welcome Frederick Grinnell. Well, thank you to the Royal Society for holding this competition and to the judges for selecting my book uh, to the shortlist and to the audience. Uh, who, you've all taken time from your busy schedules to be here tonight, which is great. It might interest you to know that for many years, a British scientist and fellow of the Royal Society named Rupert Billingham was my department chair in Dallas, Texas. Without Billingham's support and encouragement, I would have not been able to engage in the dual work of doing science and philosophizing about science that brings me here today. So the following reading comes from chapter six of my book, which has turned out to be the most controversial. It's called Faith for Science, and, uh, uh, and it's a little bit autobiographical that uh, also allows one to appreciate how I came to be interested in, in philosophy. I began to appreciate the idea that science requires faith at the Franklin Institute Science Museum in Philadelphia. The Franklin Institute was originally founded in 1824, and its mission is to inspire an understanding of and passion for science and technology learning. In the late 1950s, I visited the museum often and became friendly with some of the local college students who watched over the exhibits and put on special shows. One of those students, Richard Rayberg, would let me join him in the science auditorium as he set up the chemistry show. One day as he was setting up, Richard turned to me and said, Prove you exist. It took me a while to understand that he was not joking. I devised all sorts of arguments in my favor. Dick responded that my ideas ultimately depended on sense experience. He made me realize that sense experience is not always reliable. The conversations with Dick Rayberg began my interest in philosophy. Why do you believe what you think you know? Years later, I realized that Dick probably was taking an introductory philosophy course at the time. <laughs> Most introductory philosophy courses have a section on the 17th, 18th century British empirist philosophers, John Locke, George Berkeley, and David Hume. The empiricists questioned what assurance we had beyond our immediate sense experience and memories for existence or matters of fact. Their realization created a paradox by making the idea of cause and effect, a central tenet of scientific thinking, depend on one's belief that the course of nature will continue uniformly the same. This belief, wrote Hume, we take for granted without any proof. Making the cause and effect relationship contingent on the observer's assumption that nature would continue tomorrow the same as today presented a potential challenge to the development of modern science. Science ignored this challenge completely, wrote philosopher Alfred North, White, Alfred North Whitehead. Instead, we have instinctive faith that there is an order of nature, instinctive faith that can, be that can be attributed to the influence of Western religious belief. And Einstein's often quoted expression, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind, reflects a similar outlook. Science is weak, without the religious belief that the world is comprehensible to reason. How ironic. In summary, science requires faith in the possibility that nature's patterns and structures can be understood. I call this faith in intelligible design, in contrast to intelligent design. And we share this faith in intelligible design with others who also believe in the uniformity and continuity, repeatability of the natural world. Indeed, the possibility of sharing intersubjectivity permits personal sense experience and memory, what Hume calls the testimony of the senses, to be transformed from the realm of individual subjectivity into the community's domain of objective knowledge. Thanks very much again.
And now we have a, an immensely um, readable book which dispels some of the myths about a, a neglected era in the history of science. God's Philosophers, How the Medieval World Laid the Foundations of Modern Science um, is written by James Hannam and it revives the forgotten philosophers, scientists, scholars and inventors of medieval Europe. It offers a, a vibrant insight, we felt, into medieval science, full of wonderful anecdotes and personalities. Would you please welcome James Hammond. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I shall uh, uh, dive right in rather than thanking the society and the judges again. A lot of the people who are in my book um, are not very well known at all, so I thought I would take uh, as my reading a short section on someone who I think all of you will have heard of. Roger Bacon was a Franciscan friar and one of a line of natural philosophers who would ensure that Oxford had an illustrious reputation for the subject throughout the late Middle Ages. Notwithstanding the importance of his work, especially in the field of optical theory, Bacon's reputation today is actually hinged on two misconceptions. First, we hear his writing has a peculiarly modern flavor, with references to experiments and future inventions like cars and planes. Second, there's a persistent myth that because he was ahead of his time, he got into serious trouble with the church. We should deal with the second of these allegations first. According to the standard biographies, the Franciscan authorities imprisoned Bacon for 10 years late in his life. Those looking for evidence of the conflict between science and religion, this is a prime example of clerical intolerance. Some historians had no doubt that the church incarcerated Bacon for his dangerous scientific opinions. For others, it was his sympathy, sympathetic view of astrology and alchemy that doomed him to a dungeon. Today, a fresh look at the surviving evidence shows that it's difficult to prove that Bacon's imprisonment happened at all, let alone that it was caused by his radical scientific views. The origin of the story is the chronicle of the 24 ministers general of the Franciscans, dating from about 1370, a full century after his alleged arrest. This document claims that Bacon was a master of theology, and imprisoned for unspecified suspect novelties. As we know that Bacon never qualified as a theological master, it's hard to give this account much credence. Furthermore, the controversy in which the Chronicle implies Bacon was involved had nothing to do with science. Rather, a sect of extremely ascetic Franciscans was stirring up trouble. These men were convinced, like Roger Bacon, that the world was about to end, and that the church should forthwith divest itself of all property in imitation of the poverty of Christ. The material riches of the medieval church are legendary, and bishops certainly had no intention of living like beggars. If Bacon had been a supporter of these spiritual Franciscans, and given the enormous piety and millennialism evident in his writings, this is plausible, he could have got into a great deal of trouble. However, the allegation that Bacon's science led to his imprisonment finds no support in the historical record. His reputation as a futurologist and experimenter has a stronger foundation, in fact. Among the most important inventions to reach Europe in the Middle Ages was a Chinese discovery of gunpowder and the earliest reference to this explosive substance in the West comes from a work of Roger Bacon, which describes firecrackers, a popular amusement in China. You might have heard about firecrackers from Franciscan missionaries who, like Marco Polo, were taking advantage of the trade routes opened up by the Mongol Empire. The conquest of Genghis Khan had imposed a bloody peace on Central Asia, which made traveling from Europe to China practicable for the first time since the fall of the Persian Empire in the 7th century. Some of Roger Bacon's work also reflects a spirit of inventiveness that permeated medieval Europe. 
in a well-known letter called On the Marvelous Power of Art and Nature, he speculates on ideas like flying machines and horseless carriages. It's possible, he says, that a car shall be made that will move with inestimable speed and the motion will be without the help of any living creature. It's possible that a device for flying shall be made such that a man sitting in the middle of it and turning a crank will cause artificial wings to beat the air after the manner of a bird's flight. Well, today we know that Bacon's idea for a flying machine would be completely ineffectual. But Victorian historians proclaimed him as a genius ahead of his time on the strength of this letter. I think perhaps a more modest view is that he was equipped with an active imagination. We should remember how much he got wrong as a result of sharing the attitudes of his time. But where Bacon was unusual was in his interest in the work of craftsmen. Most medieval scholars had no time for technology and handiwork. And this was partly a reflection of the views of Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, who thought that any kind of trade was beneath the dignity of intellectuals. This is an area where Christianity provided a useful counter to pagan chauvinism. After all, Jesus himself had been a carpenter. But old prejudices were slow to die out, and most university-educated men did not involve themselves with manual work. So in his opus Maeus, Roger Bacon has to try hard to convince the Pope of the importance of experimental science. But even this term does not have quite the meaning that we might expect. A large element of Bacon's thought was clearly magical, and the experimental work he did carry out appears to have been devoted to alchemy, a pursuit which swallowed up all of his cash. Although he probably did carry out a good deal of meddling in magical practices, he was not putting forward the kind of research program that today we would recognize as scientific, because Roger Bacon was a man of his own time and not of ours. Thanks very much, James. And now, Life Ascending. Uh, this is by Nick Lane, and it charts the history of life on Earth by describing the ten greatest inventions of life, based on their historical impact, their importance in living organisms, and their iconic power. Uh, and we enjoyed this book because, without asking your science grades, Lane takes you on an elegant and adventurous step-by-step -step guide to what makes life the way it is. It's beautifully written with a satisfying overarching structure. Nick Lane. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. I'll read a short passage from the beginning of the book. I'll start at the start uh, on the origin of life. Night followed day in swift succession. On Earth at that time, a day lasted for only five or six hours. The planet spun madly on its axis. The moon hung heavy and threatening in the sky, far closer and so looking much bigger than today. Stars rarely shone, for the atmosphere was full of smog and dust, but spectacular shooting stars regularly threaded the night sky. The sun, when it could be seen at all through the dull red smog, was watery and weak, lacking the vigour of its prime. Humans could not survive here. Our eyes would not bulge and burst as they may on Mars, but our lungs could find no breath of oxygen. We'd fight for a desperate minute and asphyxiate. The Earth was named badly. Sea would have been better. Even today, oceans cover two-thirds of our planet, dominating views from space. Back then, the Earth was virtually all water, with a few small volcanic islands poking through the turbulent waves. In thrall to that looming moon, the tides were colossal, ranging perhaps hundreds of feet. Impacts of asteroids and comets were less common then than they had been earlier when the largest of them flung off the moon. But even in this period of relative tranquility, the oceans regularly boiled and churned. From underneath, too, they seethed. The crust was riddled with cracks. Magma welled and coiled, and volcanoes made the underworld a constant presence. It was a world out of equilibrium, a world of restless activity, a feverish infant of a planet. It was a world on which life emerged. 3,800 million years ago, perhaps animated by something of the restlessness of the planet itself. 
We know because a few grains of rock from that bygone age have survived the restless eons to this very day. Inside them are trapped the tiniest specks of carbon, which bear in their atomic composition the nearly unmistakable imprint of life itself. If that seems a flimsy pretext for a monumental claim, perhaps it is. There isn't a full consensus among experts. But strip away a few more skins from the onion of time, and by 3,400 million years ago, the signs of life are unequivocal. The world was heaving with bacteria then, bacteria that left their mark not just in carbon signatures, but in microfossils of many diverse forms, and in those domed cathedrals of bacterial life, the meter-high stromatolites. Bacteria dominated our planet for another 2,500 million years before the first truly complex organisms appeared in the fossil record. And some say they still do, for the gloss of plants and animals doesn't match the bacteria for biomass. What was it about that early Earth that first breathed life into inorganic elements? Are we unique or exceedingly rare, or was our planet but one in a million billion hatcheries scattered across the universe? According to the anthropic principle, it scarcely matters. If the probability of life in the universe is one in a million billion, then in a million billion planets, there is a chance approaching one that life should emerge somewhere. And because we find ourselves on a living planet, obviously we must live on that one. However exceedingly rare life might be, in an infinite universe, there is always a probability of life emerging on one planet, and we must live on that planet. If you find overly clever statistics unsatisfying, as I do, here's another unsatisfying answer put forward by no less a statesman of science than Fred Hoyle and later Francis Crick. Life started somewhere else and infected our planet, either by chance or by the machinations of some godlike extraterrestrial intelligence. Perhaps it did. Who would go to the state to say it didn't? But most scientists would back away from such reasoning, with good reason. It is tantamount to an assertion that science cannot answer the question before we've even bothered to look into whether science can, in fact, answer it. The usual reason given for seeking salvation elsewhere in the universe is time. There has not been enough time on Earth for the stupefying complexity of life to evolve. But who says? The Nobel laureate Christian de Duve, equally eminent, argues altogether more thrillingly that the determin determinism of chemistry means that life had to emerge quickly. In essence, he says, chemical reactions must happen rapidly or not at all. If any reaction takes a millennium to complete, then the chances are that all the reactants will simply dissipate or break down in the meantime unless they're continually replenished by other faster reactions. The origin of life was certainly a matter of chemistry, so the same logic applies. The basic reactions of life must have taken place spontaneously and quickly. So life at a douve is far more likely to evolve in 10,000 years than in 10 billion we can never know how life really started on Earth. Even if we succeed in producing bacteria or bugs that crawl out from some swirling chemicals in a test tube, we will never know if that is how life actually started on our planet, merely that such things are possible and perhaps more likely than we once thought. But science is not about exceptions, it's about rules, and the rules that govern the emergence of life on our own planet should apply throughout the universe. The quest for the origin of life is not an attempt to reconstruct what happened at 6.30 a.m. on Thursday morning in the year 3,851 million B.C., but for the general rules that must govern the emergence of life, any life, anywhere in the universe, and especially on our planet, the only example we know. While the story we'll trace is almost certainly not correct in every particular, it is, I think, broadly plausible. I want to show that the origin of life is not the great mystery it is sometimes made out to be, but that life emerges, perhaps almost inevitably, from the turning of our globe. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, and now we need to talk about Kelvin by Marcus Chow. Uh, read this, and the judges felt your world <coughs> will never look the same again. Uh, this is a book which takes very familiar uh, features of our everyday world um, and then takes a much closer look, puts a spin on them, to explain profound truths about the ultimate nature of reality. We found this an inspiring book that explains ideas of advanced physics from the atom to the Big Bang and shows how physics forms part of our everyday world. Marcus Chan. Thank you. Well, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to see so many of you. And, and I'm really, really happy to be shortlisted for this prize. Uh, as Maggie said, my book is about what everyday things tell us about the universe. 
So I'm going to read from at the beginning of a chapter of my book called Random Reality. The world is complex. Rain clouds scud across the sky. A tree sways gently in the breeze. A woman in a red coat walks her cream poodle down the street and stops at a pedestrian crossing. Describing such a scene precisely requires a vast amount of information. It is necessary, for instance, to specify the location and shape and composition of every cloud, the location and shape of every branch and leaf on the tree, and so on. The reason it takes so much information is that a lot of things have to be specified in order to ensure that the scene is uniquely distinguishable from the myriad other possibilities. This is because there are an awful lot of ways the scene could be different, an awful lot of alternative ways its stuff could be arranged. A cloud could be in another place. A lamppost could substitute for the tree. A man walking his pet ferret could replace the woman and the dog. In fact, to be sure the scene cannot be mistaken for any other possible scenes, it is necessary to specify the location and properties of every single atom, every subatomic particle even. The, obs the observation that a vast amount of information is needed to describe the universe may seem trite and of little consequence, but actually it is telling us something profound about our universe. It is telling us that the world around us is the way we find it and not some other way because of pure chance. It is telling us that the complexity of the world is the outcome of a long series of rolls of the dice extending all the way back to the beginning of time. Einstein famously said, God does not play dice with the universe. The irony is that not only does God play dice with the universe, but if he did not, there would be no universe, at least of the richness and complexity for life to have arisen. Thank you. It's, it's getting very cosy up here. And certainly, this is the first year that all of the authors have been able to be present. So, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful, and, and we're honoured to have all of you here. And now we, we come to our final book, uh, Why Does E Equal MC Squared? Now, this is by Brian Cox and Jeff Forshaw. We, we felt this offered an illuminating journey to reveal the meaning behind Einstein's most famous formula. Um, it's explained in a lively and un understandable way from basic ideas to the full, mind-blowing E equals MC squared. And we were delighted to find that our knowledge of equations, long forgotten since leaving school for some of us, reinvigorated, and we felt ourselves rediscovering our joy of mathematics. Brian Cox, Jeff Forshaw. <laughs> Thanks, and I would also like to thank the Royal Society and, and the judges especially, because I myself was a judge, I think it was three years ago now, and I know how daunting it is to receive 130, 140 books <laughs> and have to almost read them all, I don't, <laughs> almost everywhere. So thank you, judges. Um, so we're going to read from the last couple of pages of our book. I apologise, I hope it doesn't spoil it if you haven't read it. But, um, so, at the end of a book on Einstein's theories of relativity... It is all too easy to contribute to an unfortunate cult of personality surrounding the great man, and this is not our intention. Indeed, such a cult probably inhibits future progress because it gives the impression that science is the preserve of supermen in possession of a unique insight inaccessible to the rest of us. Nothing could be further from the truth. Reality, uh, relativity was not the work of one man, although in a book about relativity this can sometimes appear to be the case. Einstein was undoubtedly one of the great practitioners of the art of science. But as we have emphasised throughout this book, he was led to his radical revision of space and time by the curiosity and skill of many. He was not a freak of nature, and his intellect was not supernatural. He was simply a great scientist who did what scientists do. He took simple things seriously and followed through the consequences logically. His genius lay in taking seriously the constancy of the speed of light, as implied by Maxwell's equations, and the equivalence principle, first appreciated by Galileo. Our hope is to have written a book that allows non-scientists to understand Einstein's beautiful theories. 
This understanding is within reach for non-experts because science is really not that difficult. Given the right starting point, the road to a deeper understanding of nature is travelled in small steps, carefully taken. Science is, at its heart, a modest pursuit, and this modesty is the key to its success. Einstein's theories are respected because they are correct, as far as we can tell, but they are no sacred tomes. They will stand, to put it bluntly, until something better comes along. Likewise, the great scientific minds are not revered as prophets, but as diligent contributors to our understanding of nature. There are certainly those whose names are familiar to millions, but there are none whose reputations can protect their theories from the harsh critique of experiment. Nature is no respecter of reputations. Galileo, Newton, Faraday, Maxwell, Einstein, Dirac, Feynman, Glashow, Salam, Weinberg, all are great. The first four were only approximately correct, and the rest may well meet the same fate during the 21st century. Having said that, we have absolutely no doubt that Einstein's special and general theories of relativity will forever be remembered as two of the greatest achievements of the human intellect, not least in the way that they show how powerful imagination can be. From an inspired mix of pure thought and a little experimental data, a man was able to change our understanding of the very fabric of the universe. That Einstein's physics is both aesthetically and philosophically pleasing, while also being extremely useful, delivers an important lesson, the true significance of which is all too rarely appreciated. Science, at its best, is driven by inquiring minds, afforded the freedom to think, coupled with the technical ability and discipline, the freedom to dream, coupled with the technical ability and discipline to think. If the society in which Einstein flourished had decided that it needed a new power source to provide for the needs of its citizens, it's impossible to imagine that some enlightened politician would have channeled public funding into an exploration of the nature of space and time. But as we have seen, it was precisely this road that led to E equals MC squared and delivered the keys to unlock the power of the atomic nucleus. From the simplest of ideas, that the speed of a beam of light is one thing upon which everyone in the universe should agree, a box of riches was discovered. From the simplest of ideas, if there were ever to be an epitaph written for humanity's greatest scientific achievements, it might begin with these five words. Taking delight in observing and considering the smallest and seemingly most insignificant details of nature has led time and again to the most majestic of conclusions. We walk in the midst of wonders, and if we open our eyes and minds to them, the possibilities are boundless. Albert Einstein will be remembered for as long as there are humans in the universe, universe both as an inspiration and an example to all those who are captivated by, the natural, by a natural curiosity to understand the world around them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope that wasn't too much of, of an ordeal. Um, it, it was a, a fabulous uh, experience for everyone to sit and just listen to you reading you know, the, just a few words and giving us a taste of your books. Um, I thought, just before I open questions to the floor, I'd just find out quickly from each of you why you wanted to write your book. What was the driver behind it? I'm a climate scientist, and I've had the good fortune to uh, go to the Antarctic and to the Arctic regions many times and see the, the majesty of the ice at our, pole, at our poles. And... I've gone enough times to see the ice changing, and the ice is telling a story about climate change on Earth. And I wanted to be able to convey that story to a much wider audience, to people who will never have the opportunity of going to the polar regions. And so that was the driving force to convey the changes that I have had the privilege of observing uh, to a much wider audience. Frederick? Well, you sort of heard from my reading mm -hmm. how I got interested and I, I teach, uh, uh, spend some time teaching anyway uh, uh, about philosophy and the nature of science to students and have always felt that it's important to try to generalize this description in a way that makes it more accessible and then to turn around and ask, well, what are the implications for the way science is done for the intersection between science and society. Do, so, do you think people have misconceptions about what really goes on? Well, I, I do think they, they do because there aren't a lot of places they can learn about what goes on. Most people learn their science from textbooks or from scientific publications, and, and really neither of those explain 
what it is uh, that scientists do or, or, or how they come about uh, the ideas that, that they learn. I, I, could I just say that I noticed that Einstein made it into three out of the six readings, <laughs> which I, I thought was uh, remarkable. Nick. Um, I have a driving desire to, to try to know, to try to understand where we came from, why we're here, what the world is made of, I suppose, and how it got to be this way. Um, I'm a biologist, uh, and, and so I tend to think about life, but uh, the whole planet as well. I've, I've taught myself some geology on the side. Um, and it's a thrilling tapestry that, uh, that writing can take you across because you're not constrained to being in the laboratory or something. You can, writing a book allows you to ask any question you want. It allows you to address, address it in any way you want. You have a completely free tapestry, and it's a wonderful, wonderful freedom. And there's a responsibility that goes with that as well to try and get it right. And, but I find that I just try to understand it myself, come face to face with my own difficulties and try and find a way through them. And, and the writing is my way of uh, understanding the world. And, and you don't shy away from some really quite difficult science in your book. Well, I think the, the, the great glory of science is, is the stuff that we don't know. It's the boundary between what we do know, which is, in a sense, dusty stuff in textbooks, and, and the stuff we don't know, which is really what research is all about. And, and I try to get across that boundary between what we know and what we don't know and, and, and the possibilities, the hypotheses, the way we can test them. That's really what science is about. But um, that means you have to lead people by the hand as far as you can to, 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 to get to that point on the frontier, and that's, that requires skills that I'm still learning. <laughs> James? Well, when I discovered um, the achievements of uh, science during the Middle Ages and the people uh, who had been forgotten, I just felt that I, I owed it to them to bring them back to light. Uh, they'd achieved so much. They had, um, as I said in the title, laid the foundations of what is such an important intellectual endeavour. Um, and yet nobody knows who they are. And that seemed to me very, very unfair. And the other thing I wanted to do, um, which perhaps has a uh, more contemporary relevance, is um, there's a perceived rift between science and religion. And these are the two most powerful intellectual forces on the planet. And if they fail to get on, we are going to have serious problems. And I wanted to show that the relationship between science and religion has been largely cordial, if uh, slightly tense at times. Um, and I wanted to show that uh, if they these two branches of, of knowledge were able to get on during the Middle Ages, it uh, shouldn't be impossible for them to get on today as well. I mean, that, that, that was one of the you know, really interesting you know, parts of the book for me, you know, realising the, you know, the mathematical popes and, and the interests that the church had. Um, was there a particular moment, because as we've intimated, you know, the, the book is stuffed full of characters, many of whom I'd never heard of, where when you were researching it, you thought, oh, I can't, this is a marvellous story. What was your favourite story? My favourite story is uh, the story of Abelard and Eloise. Um, Abelard was a, a 12th century um, philosopher, a very, very important philosopher, but he's particularly interesting because he had a, a very passionate affair with his student, Eloise, um, and uh, Eloise's uncle took a violent objection to this and, uh, and had Abelard castrated um, which did, <laughs> didn't stop his academic career, I'm pleased to say. The, the thing that stunned me in the book was how good they were at castration and how fast, <laughs> thankfully. I, I have to admit that I, I'm, I'm slightly squeamish, and so there are, <laughs> there are elements of medieval history which I tend to sort of avert my gaze from a little bit. <laughs> and how about yourself, Marcus? Well, um, you write a book, it's, uh, I don't know, 70,000 words long. And then you have to publicise it. And you often go on radio stations and they say, you've got one minute and 40 seconds <laughs> to explain your book. And um, I find that, that I, I end up grabbing everyday things and trying to relate them to, to the listener. And then someone, one day I suddenly thought, well, why don't I do this for a book? You know, why don't I just write about everyday things that we all know about? And, and, and tell people what, what they tell us about the, the, the universe. So really, that was, that was the simple idea behind the book. Yeah, you 
you've sort of said uh, somewhere that you, you feel that you need to know science well enough on, on aspects of it to be able to explain it to someone waiting for a number 52 bus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was fortunate enough. I went to Caltech and I was taught by Richard Feynman. I was very lucky. And he, he, his criterion of whether he understood something, I mean, he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, you know, probably the greatest post-war American physicist. But his criterion of whether he could actually understand anything, whether he understood anything, was whether he could actually explain it to, to one of the gardeners at Caltech. And, and I kind of feel that as well, you know. I mean, if, if you suddenly try, try explaining it to someone waiting for number 52 bus and you can't explain it, you obviously don't understand it. So, yeah, it's good, good, good criterion. Um, and then a, a writing team, uh, how, how did that work out for you? Um, I mean, we, we have a... Uh, actually, most of the research that I've done, actually, over the past 15 years or so, Manchester, a lot of it has been with Jeff, actually. So we, have a, we had a history of writing academic papers together, and we still do. And we, we've developed, a, I think we've had a long history of, of asking each other questions about science, some that are simple and some that are complex and academic. You know. And in this case, I mean, actually, my, my wife, who is in the audience somewhere, had asked me, um, why does E equals MC squared, actually? You know, and, and so I'd thought about it and as Marcus said actually you have to can, can I explain it to a gardener or someone or my wife right and how quickly can I explain it and, and I realized that I couldn't explain it very simply just off the cuff right I didn't actually have an answer so I, I did what I usually do and asked Jeff and he didn't have an answer and we found it an interesting question didn't we actually and we spent about a year actually just messing around trying to find out what the simplest path was to, to explain in relativity in particular yeah, yeah. I, I, I love doing physics, and it, 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 it's, I, mean, I want to share that love of physics. And the universe is a, it's an amazing place. It's amazing, it's bizarre, and it's very beautiful. And I wanted to write a book that could communicate why it is that I feel like that about science. So rather than those just being words that you throw out there, and rather than just describing a piece of science, I wanted to try to convey why it is that I think that, 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 that the universe is so wonderful. And it equals mc squared and Einstein's theory of relativity really provide a possibility to, to, to do that. Well, as you can gather, I could go on chatting to them all night, but that would be very unfair. So um, if, if you've got some questions, can I ask you to raise your hands? We've got a couple of mics in, in, in the room. Um, please wait until the microphone makes its way to you, because that makes it so much easier for us to, to hear your questions. So any questions for our, our panel of authors? Who would like to kick us off? Oh, yeah, there's a, a gentleman just down. This gentleman is down at the, the back of the room. Um, so, so, a fascinating evening, I might say. Anyway, some years ago, um, the poet and playwright um, <clears throat> Ronald Duncan, who actually wrote a play about Abelard Eloise, and the then amateur scientist, uh, Marina, I think it was, no, Miranda Weston Smith, edited and brought out a two volume paperback entitled The Encyclopedia of the Unknown scientists were asked what they would most like to learn about possible science in the future. And I wonder, you know, if our authors tonight would like to ask or, or, or give an answer to the question, what would they most like to find out now about science, something that's not known at present, and would they write their next book about it? <laughs> So, um, who'd like to kick us off on this one? You know, what? I mean, I'd like to know what the 98% of the universe that's invisible is. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure Lord Rees would like to know as well. Uh, well, I would like to... I guess I'd like to know how life really did evolve on Earth at the very beginning of the origin of life. Um, I, I would like to see it constrained experimentally uh, to have some kind of crystal idea of this is really how it happened. I'm looking forward to having my understanding of the universe shattered by the results of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs> yes, it's, it's Hopefully I won't have to wait too long. <laughs> no. It's worth saying that one of the big questions at the moment is the origin of mass in the universe. What, what, makes, what gives things mass? And that is a question we will have an answer to within the next 
five or six years, and it's a, it's, a, it's a door that's blocking our understanding of the forces of nature, or three of the four forces of nature. Yeah, one, one, I, I saw something really stunning at Durham University where they've, they've run a program and, and they simulate, well, it's the end of our universe, but it's, it, it is really the end of our universe, and, and it's just extraordinary <coughs> and awe-inspiring to sit there and look at it, and it's not a reconstruction, you know, it's, it's, it's built on scientific facts. It's one of, the, one of the most amazing things about the, the science of cosmology and our understanding of stars and the end states of stars is that we can contemplate numbers, years, like numbers like 10 to the power 100 years, which is the time that many people give for the time that it takes black, all the black holes in the universe to evaporate. Now, 10 to the 100 is... Think about that. It's, the, the universe is 10 to the 10 years old at the moment, roughly. 10 to the 100 minus 10 to the 10 is 10 to the 100. Right? We've not made an impact on, the, on, the, on this, this possible history of the universe. So I find it remarkable that we can contem even contemplate numbers, like that's Carlos Frank's group at Durham, isn't it? You're mm. talking about trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of years in, in an intelligible way, right? using science to do it. It's astonishing. See, it's even more remarkable than that, because actually the origin of all the structure in the universe came about through, we, we think, through what happened in the first 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So... The, the, the stretch is from the very, very smallest times to the very the times that Prime was talking about. No, it is absolutely, you know, <coughs> and, the more, and then it is one of those things is that the more you think about it, the, the more completely mind boggling it, it, it all becomes. Um, do we have any more questions? Yep. Um, thank you very much. Um, good evening. Um, I'm always curious as to whether authors have great angst over the titles of books as to whether it causes, um, you know, problems between themselves and uh, publishers. Thank you. So, uh, for each, each author. <laughs> <laughs> the answer for me is yes. Uh, I think that uh, this is my second uh, book and the struggles with the publisher for the title have been as much angst as I ever want to go through. Uh, each of us has different ideas of what we want to convey with the title. And uh, I have the, I won't call it the misfortune because I'm happy with my title, but it was a great struggle with the publisher and the editor to reach that, that compromise. And it was the same in my earlier book as well. So uh, ultimately it's the, it's the right of the author to choose the title and occasionally you just have to uh, exercise that right and, and override the publisher. And, and Frederick, so, am, am I right in thinking that you had several titles? Actually, you... yeah, in the afterword of the book, I talk about the titles that it didn't turn out to be. The first of which was The Intentionality of Science, uh, which nobody could understand. And so, uh, <laughs> and so that was abandoned. And then Circles of Science, and then there was one other one. I also had problems with the cover. You mentioned covers. And, uh, and actually, you, you all commented in your, at one point about the cover. Don't look at the cover or something. And um, I, I had in mind, uh, there, one of my very favorite paintings is a Rene Magritte painting called Perspicacity. And in this painting, it shows the artist, it's actually a self-portrait of Magritte, uh, painting uh, a bird while looking at an egg. And, and it really uh, uh, is, uh, it, it really epitomizes the expression that discovery is looking what everybody else has seen and thinking what nobody else has thought, a famous uh, 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 comment that's been made in the past. And, now, that would have been a great cover. That's what I wanted for the cover. And, and, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and Oxford in uh, New York said, no, it'll look too much like an art book. Forget it. And so, uh, and so uh, this is what we ended up with. And, you know, so... Uh, uh, we'll see. I, we're, I, we're debating now because they're going to do a paperback, and I'm trying to convince them to do a more interesting cover, but who knows? <laughs> it may look the same. Yeah. Title for your book. Was, was uh, it well, clear this, from the word? On this occasion, it wasn't too bad. On the, the last book I wrote was on mitochondria, and that really caused serious problems because <laughs> how are you going to get sell even a single copy? And so I, I, I ended up calling it Power, Sex, Suicide. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> mitochondria and the meaning of life. And uh, that, that, had, that kind of backfired on me somewhat. People were frightened to read it on the tube and so on. <laughs> <laughs> I had one review who, who said uh, that he'd, he'd read my earlier book on oxygen uh, and he'd quit smoking after reading my book, so he approached my book on sex with some trepidation. <laughs> <laughs> They are a trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And was it, was it an obvious choice for your title? Or did you have long, hard debates about it? Well, I, I followed Lord Ruth's maxim that you should definitely have God in your title if you want to sell <laughs> books. Um, and uh, the, the subtitle was, was always there. And, and uh, the title uh, really just followed from the need to have something that was catchy. Um, I started off by calling it the genesis of science. Um, and then it became God's philosophy, which we thought was more catchy, but for reasons which are completely beyond me, um, the American edition is to be called the genesis of science. I don't know why they don't keep the same title. And how about you, Marcus? Uh, a bit, bit of a pun in the title. Yeah, titles are the hardest things. I mean, I, I, my wife Karen's in the, in the audience, and she knows we waste entire holidays going through <laughs> books, of, books of poetry, song titles... Uh, it's incredibly difficult to find a good title. Uh, uh, that one occurred to me uh, at home. I actually went to a talk that uh, Lionel Shriver, who wrote We Need to Talk About Kevin, uh, uh, she, she, she gave a talk at Cheltenham, and I was too shy to go up and ask her to write a forward. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Do you like the pun? I like, I like the pun, yeah, but it's I'm very hard. What, what does she do? Do you know what I she don't does? know. I don't know. I, was, I, I wondered if she might sue me for... for, for, for <laughs> Well, actually, there doesn't seem to be any copyright in titles. I wrote a book called The Universe Next Door, and there seem to be dozens of books with that title. <laughs> so that's a line from E. Cummings, that the best titles come from poetry or Shakespeare. And was it just decided in a minute? I mean, it's, it's, it's great, the title of your book. It's, you know. <laughs> well, we're both what? plain-speaking uh, <laughs> lads from the <laughs> northwest, so Alter. it kind of did the job, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 actually, the discussion was the other title, because they always have a subtitle, don't they? And we didn't know that, but the publisher said, you've got to, it's going to be wider sequencing squared and then something in brackets after it. They always do that. And it just says, and why should we care? Because we didn't care what the subtitle was at all. And so the publisher just all... <laughs> so put it there. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, we've, got, we've got time for one more question before we put our authors out of the mis their misery. Yes, you can take a microphone over to this gentleman here. Hi. Um, I can't help noticing you're all white middle-class men. Um, is, is that, is that should, should we care? Does that matter? Does it have any impact on... Uh, is it healthy for science book readers? Just interested. What that, what's that all about? It's not, <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault we're the best authors. <laughs> um, we, we had, I think, on our long, long list, um, when we started, uh, you know, going through the... 134 books. I think there were 10 or 12 books from women. Um, and I, just speaking for myself, I, mean, I, I read every book on its own terms, you know. Um, so it, it is really sad that there isn't a female author up here on this stage. You know, that is, you know, I think we can all, all echo that. It would have been fabulous. But equally, it would have been incredibly patronising to have gone through the books and then thought, oh, gosh, we need a, we need a woman. That would have been dreadful. So, you know, it, it, you know th this is what it is. Th this, these represent, you know, our, our six finest books, you know, this year. Yep. Yep. D d yeah, do, do speak there again. Many fewer, the, of the 134 books, very few were published by women. Mm -hmm. So the, the odds were stacked already. So the question we should be asking is why aren't more women writing science books? Sorry, that last question was asking. Yeah. yeah. Why, why is it you, you guys are writing science books and not, you know, more diverse books? I mean, there is a, there is a, a, a deeper question there, which is um, it goes to how you how science is perceived am amongst kids in general, actually. And what one of the goals, I think, for people who popularise science is, is to show kids that, first of all, science is something they can do, 
So I think we try to say at the end of our book, you don't have to be a genius to be a scientist. You don't have to be Einstein. You, anyone who's interested essentially can be a scientist. But it's also to show, I think, that, that there is clearly there has been a barrier to girls going into science. And some of it is, as you suggest in your question, I think, the perception that, that science is the preserve of old men. Right? And that, that, that's very important. I mean, it's very interesting with Einstein because if you, if you, if you say to a, a, a child, draw a scientist, they tend to draw something that looks like the old Einstein with white hair all over the place and maybe a test tube. And actually Einstein, the, the, the point is, he was, he, the, the special relativity certainly was written when he was, what, 30? 30? Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, so he was a young man um, at the time, but you see him in, in the public perception, he's an old man. So I think that's one of the great challenges for, for science popularisation, is to break down that barrier for kids in general and girls in particular. And, and, and it's hugely ironical because I, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that one of the reasons the Royal Society asked me was because um, I came here one day and I was looking around and it's just a wonderful building and you've got all of these pictures of all the magnificent scientists up. And then I started counting and I think I counted three women and about 56 men in all of the pictures. And I thought, you know, th this has got to change and it's no reflection on the Royal Society because they do really wonderful work and it's one of the reasons that I set up Teen Tech because I got so frustrated at talking endlessly about how can we get more women interested in science and also more importantly perhaps how can we get more women to progress right the way through so that we have more female professors and more women in senior positions in science and more women visible um, you know, in, in, in science. Because, uh, yeah, you're right, that the impression that teenagers have is that, you know, wild, mad-looking person with antisocial habits. And, and we know that they're not all like that. <laughs> I'd like to take issue with your question, actually. I, I'm not middle class. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is uh, the witching hour um, of 10 to 8. This was the moment I was asked to, uh, to say that uh, Lord Rees is going to come onto the stage and make the announcement. I'd like you to give a, a huge round of applause to our authors, who I'd like to invite to go back into the, into the audience. Thank you so much. Before I open the uh, envelope, let me add my congratulations to all the shortlisted authors and say that uh, um, to all those who are not the winner, uh, a cheque will soon be in the post for £1,000. So congratulations again to all the shortlisted authors. According to what's written in front of me here, the winner of the Royal Society Prize for Science Books in 2010 is Life Ascending. hardly know what to say. I didn't expect this at all. I was supposed to probably break down in tears and thank all my family. Uh, I shall, uh, I w I'll try not to do that because I'm, uh, well, I'm a bloke. <laughs> so, um, it's a great honour, really, even just to be shortlisted. I'm, I'm quite taken aback by this. I I've been, I was shortlisted before, uh, and, and I knew that time there wasn't a hope in hell's chance because uh, it was a 
quite a difficult book. This time I appreciated I had a better chance, but uh, it's, it was very open this year. It seemed to me that anyone could have won it very easily. Um, and I don't know what criteria were used by the judges, but I do know that if you shift those criteria and nudge them over a tiny bit a different way, it would have been a different winner. I've been following the Science Book Prize really since its inception. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a highlight of the, the year for a lot of scientists, especially for people who try to write. And a lot of my heroes have won in the past. A lot of my heroes never won in the past, and, uh, and so I've never really had my own hopes up. But it's something that uh, certainly I've found when I, when I write a book, I, I do strive um, partly to write as well as I can. But having, a, having a, 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 a prize like this does give some focus in your efforts because what the prize stands for is, uh, is, is the best efforts to get the best science across to as wide an audience as possible. And it's, it's been a wonderful um, institution, really. And I, I just would like to say that uh, I, I really hope that uh, the funding materializes to, to keep it going, because uh, this is a highlight of the year for many people, and I hope it continues for much longer. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like finally uh, to thank all the judges for their hard work and uh, for this wonderful presentation we've had this evening. Thank you very much.